Hello, Hello everybody. Hello. And welcome to the next show. The future is unpredictable. This has always been the case. However, during the past months, this has become even more tangible. And yet we try to grasp the future, rely on expert predictions, cling to models that help us structure the unknown. With our next activities, we have been trying to look ahead from the start to understand what will become relevant for innovators and business leaders in the years to come and to think about more desirable futures. To do so, we read the signals in order to predict shifting behaviors and meta trends. Sometimes we see things coming, sometimes we don't. This week saw developments in the US that I wouldn't have predicted even my wildest dreams. Three things struck me in this context especially. Racism is very deeply woven into our societies, not only in the US. So becoming aware of unconscious biases and one's own misconceptions is a bigger obligation than ever. Staying silent on these matters is no longer an option. This is also true for brands and digital platforms. While we see a polarization of parts of our society, we also see a growing part of our society that aims for a future that is more just and is willing to fight for it. So we all have to think about our own role in this and how to make a difference. Thank you for joining us today for our new episode of What's Next. My name is Ina Feisotzer. I'm responsible for the next conference and our further activities. I'm here on our digital stage with our curator, Monique van Dusseldorf from Amsterdam and our keynote in residency, David Metten from London. Joining us from Australia today is the political scientist and futurist, Professor Sohail Inayatola. He is the UNESCO chair in future studies and is consulting governments, companies and NGOs and also kids and students. Thank you for joining the show today to discuss preferable futures. Thanks, Monique. Okay, let's do this. Professor, thank you so much for joining us. Um, there's so much to talk about, but I want to get the one of the big questions that I know will be on everyone's mind out of the way first. You are one of the world's most eminent futurists, and I know that the big question everyone wants to ask you when they meet you is, what's the future? What's going to happen next? So I would love to settle that question first. I know you recently talked about four big scenarios for a post-pandemic, a post-virus world, um, and I think we can see those flashing on the screen at some point. Um, but yeah, I wondered if you just want to talk about those for, four scenarios a little bit, and most important, which of them you think is most likely? What do you think is going to happen next? Uh, in our work in futures, we tend to shy away a bit from prediction because the world is rapidly changing. and We want people to think of alternatives. So a month ago, we started to look at what are all the text, the data, what are people saying? Scenario one was very much in the CDC in the U.S., zombie apocalypse that this will create cycles and cycles and ripples of fear. In a zombie world, you don't trust anyone. So you're always wondering who is the evil one, who is the zombie out there? So that clearly creates a society where trust is lost. What does that mean for business, your organization, your country? That's scenario one. Scenario two was the great pause and then back to business as usual, which is this is our year of rest. No flights, no endless workshops all over the world, people slow down, reconnect with self, connect with family, connect with nature when they can leave the lockdown. So this was the slowdown. And then next year, we go back to what we used to do. And there was a whole range of new literature called the Great Awakening. We slow down not to go back, we slow down to transform. So if you go back to Alibaba in 2003 during SARS, that challenged the entire business model and they went online. So this is forcing everyone to do things differently. And people are saying, well, I don't want to go back to the way things were before. This one school I'm working with, in January, we ran 170 teachers through a futures process. They said, we want flexibility. We want more connectivity. We don't want to do school the way we've been doing for the last few hundred years. 
I met with them again a week ago and they said, okay, our core story with let's be flexible, learn anywhere on time. And then now as the lockdown ends, we'll keep the virtual and do some face to face. So this is scenario three where this leads to a reawakening and awakening in perspective and technology and purpose. Scenario four is the tough one, the great despair. So the contradictions between, you might say, ethnicities, between countries, the contradictions lead to a seven-year recession depression. The virus mutates, and this is just the beginning of the pandemics. I mean, with my colleagues in the health fields, we've been talking about this for 15 years. Everyone kept on saying the next pandemic, the next pandemic, and now we're in this horrible sci-fi movie. So in this one, the horrible sci-fi movie continues. So here are four futures. In the zombie one, nations start to fracture. They can't, if there's no trust, what keeps you from doing anything you're doing? In the deep pause, here's the chance for rest. In the transformation, we're always looking for, as we leave this, what do we need to keep from this? And the fourth one is, be ready for seven years of depression. Yeah. And so we're all hoping we avoid the great despair. But I'm fascinated by this idea that exactly as you say, you know, futures work and foresight work, contrary to what most people think, is not really so much about predicting the future or trying to know the future. Um, I, I, I've read some fascinating stuff you've written about how it's actually more about the present and trying to reframe your vision of the, of now. Right. Yeah. You, you want to use the future to change today. When you talk about today, the politics is so entangled, no one can take a step forward unless you have a leader or a group of leaders or citizens say, here's where we want to be in 2030. So when I work with young kids, when I work with ministers, organizations, there's a battle about today. We said, we get that battle. Tell us the world in 2030. If that's your world, what are you doing today to start to create that? So then your actions about your vision inform what you do every morning when you wake up who you connect with, who you talk with. So then you look around the world, which prime ministers, which CEOs are actually living that future vision and which are ensuring today gets worse. That becomes a criteria. Yeah. So the best foresight work, I guess, is really about empowering you, you to take action now to change your present and move towards the future you want. It's agency. There's so many blocks we see in the world. I've been working with various mental health groups, and we said we can tell there'll be more youth suicide, suicide in the next five, six, seven years. How do we make sure that doesn't happen? And this goes to narrative. They said our narrative is a world full of roadblocks. I said, what does that mean systemically or structurally? They said, well, that means health officers don't talk to law enforcement, don't talk to ministers, don't talk to city designers. So we have a system where it's roadblocks. So I said, OK, what do you want? Well, so we want a connected system with real time information for people with lived experience or mental illness to help them and assist. So then we said, well, the narrative helps create the new future. So we said, what's the better narrative? The data tree, real time data sharing. So you can start to figure out here's a more likely person might commit suicide. And we have Japanese cities are trying to get those early warning indicators. So foresight is where do you wish to be? What are the snooze and what are these early warning indicators we can see aha uh -huh, problem coming or opportunity coming? Let's jump on the wave and write it. So let's zero in on something I really want to ask you about um, that I hope will be super useful for our audience, too. We know we're in a very chaotic moment or it feels very chaotic right now. It feels very uncertain. Um, everyone is asking what is coming next um, and how do I plan for the future? How do I make sense of this? We've talked about how futures work and foresight work is not about knowing the future, but I would love it if you can give a, a, a framework or a, a mental model that can help people watching this, you know, the business people, the founders, the CEOs, the marketers, can help those people think in a structured, constructed way about the future and what is coming next for them individually and also as businesses, as organizations, like a framework or a model. And it has to be super simple so that people, the people watching this can remember it and go out and use it. Like, what is that framework or mental model for you? So I call it the what works perspective. So the first thing is go from prediction to futures and asset, something you can use. The second thing is we ask, what's the use future? 
what's one thing I'm doing that doesn't work, but I keep on doing it? Is it endless hours in a car? Is it work nine to five, five days a week? So that's the used future. Get rid of it. The third is what's coming down the road. Weak signals. Is it technology? Is it demographic shift? Is it changes in what we eat, end of meat? Is it new food sources? So what's coming down the road? The fourth is scenarios. Not one future, but many futures, as we did with COVID-19. Always think of alternatives. There's alternatives. There's less conflict, less violence, more opportunities, more new ideas, more products, more services. Then where do you wish to be? Not just alternatives. Get very clear in your mind, in your personal life, 2030, where are you? What are you doing? And what does it feel like? Then the next part of it, what's the supportive narrative? The old narrative we were looking at, cities designed, cities, this is the old narrative was, I love my car. That leads to congestion, pollution. We're seeing with COVID-19, pollution levels drop everywhere. So the new metaphor could be, I love my city. I love nature or everything within reach. Then you design the future based on the narrative. If you go through this process, an asset, get rid of the used future, what's coming down the road, scenarios, what's your vision, and what's the new story, that will pretty much help. I've done this at every level, the prime minister level, with eight-year-olds. We had some parents start to cry and said, oh, my God, I thought my kid for sure was going to be a drug addict. He now has, she now has a vision of the future and a way to get there. Yeah, I love this idea of, of thinking, uh, first of all, almost about the used future, about things, um, things in your present trends you are riding or habits you are in that just no longer work and the pandemic has been incredible for exposing those to us like on a collective level you know we kind of knew it didn't make sense anymore that we're trekking to the office five days a week in this morning commute with millions of other people trekking back home in the evening to do this knowledge work sat at a computer that we could have done at home we kind of knew that it didn't make sense anymore that we were flying all around the world constantly constantly and that's not sustainable um, and it would be so powerful, wouldn't it, for people to think in their, their own lives, to think <clears throat> individually about what the crisis has shown them in their own lives is just not working anymore that they can dispense with. I guess that's one we power. Can see, for people yeah, we can see that in the U.S., right? The U.S. is very clear. The deep divide is not working. You can't have a great nation if there's a deep divide whether between rich and poor ethnicity. So the contradictions, COVID-19 is bringing out these contradictions. They're saying, hey, look at this. So in this sense, the metaphor around the crisis is important. Is it just the disease? You find a scientific medical cure. But what if it's more than that? What if it's more early identification? This is pandemic one. What about climate change? This is our chance to make a huge shift of the world. And further, there's the writer Roy says, see it as a portal. So you see the crisis as a pandemic, as a portal to create this alternative future you wish to see. So if it's a portable, we're on a transition somewhere. In that transition, there's contradictions we're facing now between us and nature, between ethnicities, between basically um, economies just on growth versus economies that are balanced. So this is kind of an opportunity to try to look at those and transform them. So this becomes the positive one. So scenario three, in terms of your early question, the great reawakening or the awakening, it's a renaissance. Here's things that don't work. Here's things that work. How do we actually go on that pathway? Yeah. There's an inner dimension too, the mindful part. Like when we do foresight work, it has to be a quietness. It's hard to receive new ideas if my mind is moving like this. It's when I'm a quiet space, meditative space, then I'm able to actually reflect on where I wish to go and basically what the alternatives are and what's wrong right now. So there's an open mind, and then you create a desired vision. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, that's so useful. And, and I mean, you can think of that as you did on huge systemic and, and national, international levels. I mean, I've even tried to uh, use the, the lockdown and this moment of pause as a chance to think just on a very micro scale individually about, um, what is my used future? What am I hanging on to that no longer makes sense? Or what, what, where am I in contradiction between what I am say I want, what I want, and what I'm doing day in, day out? Um, like this moment can be a powerful moment for that kind of individual reflection too, right? Yeah, the factory model of education, the factory model of farming, 
they were great in the 18th century. In 2020, not so great. So those structures got us here. They can't get us through the portal. We have to let them go. Yeah, okay. Now, before we head to the audience for some questions, if we have any, um, I'd love to just ask you quickly about, you mentioned this a few times. I know narrative is central to your foresight work. You know, you talk about a lot of your work as narrative foresight. Um, tell us a bit about that and why narrative and storytelling is such a powerful tool when it comes to foresight. And again, how the audience out there can use that. Well, in my world, I find with, org with organizations at every level, international to, again, young kids, it's data plus story. If you live in a data world, you have information, but you're unable to communicate or influence. If you live in a story world, you have wonderful visions and ideas, but you don't connect to the real world. So we're always trying to connect data with story. So we say, okay, if there's a problem in your life, what's the unconscious story? So I was with someone the other day and she was saying, well, I don't have enough time. So the normal response is read a book on time management, right? And she don't know, well, how do I create time? What are the conflicts around time? What do I need to get rid of? And then it became very clear the inner story was time was like an enemy. And then she changed the narrative to time is a friend. Time creates purpose. So you switch from this whole battle around time to now time being an asset, a friend. And then actually then basically time is purposeful. So then every morning you decide what should I do today? What gives purpose? What gives joy? What gives, which, what gives direction? What gives service? So once you shift the story, you act differently. And of course, we know the world looks different. Because you see the world differently and then you behave differently and people see you differently. So it creates a cycle of alternative futures. And the empirical <clears> research shows that's the case. You change a story, the world actually looks different and people respond in st from story. Right. It just it just feels to me that we're, we're such storytelling animals. And whether you like it or not, you're walking around with this story in your head um, and that might not be serving you. And it can be so powerful to in the ways you've said to you know you've given some some powerful tools there to think about the story you're carrying around and and, and try to change it in a productive way um and i think okay let's go, point. go ahead sorry go on go on well you at the point people say well it's not a true story and i said well no it's your point does it serve you in the future you want now you can have a debate then about politicians they use story for short-term exclusive politics and we're suggesting here, this is a portal to a Guyan polity. We use story as an inclusive vehicle to bring more people in. So this is moving from just GDP to people, planet, prosperity, purpose. So the story can be used in inappropriate ways or it can be used, let's, is it serving us creating a better world? Okay, let's head to the audience and see if they have any questions for you, Inna, do we have any audience questions? Before I hand over to the audience, so to speak, I would um, like to ask if you could uh, give some insights. I know you're working with uh, younger kids and students. How do they imagine the future? What is their picture they're sharing? Well, I mean, I can't say right now because, you know, right now there could be some anxiety, right? I know... I, I was talking to my daughter and I said to her, you know, you're living through unprecedented times, dramatic times. And she said, I'm sick of these unprecedented times. Can't we have something normal? So there's a sense that it's too much going on. We need to slow it down, perhaps. So that's one thing. When we do inner work, my favorite example is, uh, I think she was 14. And I said, what's your vision of the future when you're 25? And she said, I'll be a CEO or run a, 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 um, a tea shop. A small tea shop will see of that. I said, fantastic. That's your vision. Then I said, what strategies are you engaged to do that? She was, I'm studying math. I'm studying science. Great. And then I said, tell me your actual metaphor. And she said, oh, the metaphor is the blinds are down. Then her colleagues, her friends were there, and they started to cry. And then I watched it, and I said, why are you crying? They said, well, she won't let us in. And then it hit her. If she wants to be a CEO by 25, she thinks it's math and science. But actually, it's communicative intelligence. It's connectivity with friends. The community makes the business. 
And then I said, so what's the better metaphor? She said, let the sun shine in. And they all hugged it out. Now I said, okay, if this is the case, what does that mean in terms of your next seven-year strategy? Let the sun shine in. What does it really mean? It means, she said, I'll need to do spiritual intelligence, technological intelligence, emotional intelligence. So I need to make sure the skill sets I now will work on match my new metaphor, taking me to my vision. So this was kind of a proud, you know, for me, profound, but watching everyone cry and hug it out, that was great. So that's kind of futures in action, creating futures, enhancing the capacity. to It's futures literacy. Thank you for saying that. It's a bit of a hard cut to uh, come to the audience questions there. Uh, there. There's one question about the markets and where China and the U.S. are heading. Do you have... Well, this is, again, scenarios, ideas? right? I mean, we have a book out in the next 500 years called Macro History, Macro Historians. And we try to look at the long waves. Those of you who read Hegel, you know about the Geist, the Hegelian spirit. And it said it went to the U.S. and of course it's going to leave. We're in a hegemonic transfer. That transfer is almost inevitable. Can we make it peaceful? So that's part one. It's a natural transfer of power. It is going to Asia for all the reasons we know. The more important question, can we make, it, make this hegemonic transfer peaceful for all to benefit? Now further then is, well, actually, is it just to China or do we create a real global governance system, a real world economy where everyone gains? So then you start to think of what EU has done, many amazing things, some not so good things, but you start to think of an Asia Confederation, an African Confederation. So you start to reimagine the world less about bipolarity, but about a world of multiple regions creating some type of governance system. That becomes the more idealistic scenario, especially with AI, virtual technology. So new technologies create new governance systems, create new economies of scale. So scenario one is U.S. hangs in forever, uses violence against self and others to maintain power, right? And we know which way that will end. Scenario two is there's a nonviolent transition to China as kind of a center. Three is this is really about a whole range of confederations on a global governance system. And scenario four is it won't matter because we have a global peer-to-peer -peer economy where everyone's connected to everyone. So those are four choices. Let's see how we act to play those out the next 30 years. Last week, we had Harper Ritu suggested to have some companies to gain state status, um, like Google or whatever, Amazon. I mean, what do you think my about own that? Professor Galtrum suggested that. He said, if you have a world governance system, then you really need to, can't be just nation states. You need citizens, companies, NGO communities, and states. So this is, I like what you're saying. It's rethinking who's eligible for governance participation. And COVID-19 again is saying the old models of geopolitics, meaning the war against, doesn't work. Because this is the politics of vulnerability. Vulnerability creates public health and greater global health. War against gets us in the same mess we've been in for the last 500 years. So that's the narrative shift I'm hoping for and trying to think, what would that look like? We move away from that old model to an alternative one. Thank you. That was the audience part. My hand back to you, David. Well, Professor, thank you so much. This has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you for joining us. And I hope that the people out there watching can take some of those tools you talked about, the used future, think about what's not working in your, in your, your own present, in your life, in your organization, think in terms of scenarios, think in terms of narrative and the preferred future and 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 build future scenarios for all of us that that work and are preferred and and avoid the dark the dark scenarios that you talked about earlier it's brilliant i hope the same thing before we let you go i'm going to hand back over to inna because there is one more urgent mission for you to undertake um so yeah inna over to you Imagine this. It is the near future. Amid increasing acute crisis on planet Earth, not so hard to imagine right now, a crack team of technologists finalizes a daring plan to start a new chapter for humanity. They will travel along with 1,000 specialist selected people far beyond the solar system to the planet next one. 
There, they will establish a permanent base, a new society, a new home for human beings. Sohal and Ayatoa, thanks to your outstanding achievements in the field of future studies, you have been chosen to be among the first 1,000 pioneers to travel to next one. But before you undertake your journey, you must answer five questions. Let's see question one. Name one luxury physical object you want to take to your new home. I would take a basketball with a basketball court. That is amazing. That's the only game I can play. So we can play together. I love it. That sounds great. Question number two. Name one exceptional person who should qualify to be among the first 1,000 pioneers. I would like some type of enlightened being type. M meditative, wise, can really go into an altered state. So that person can keep us, you know, centered and in bliss. Help us in that journey. Because there will be risk and dangers and anxiety, all the normal stuff. I love that idea. Create one law that bans something from next one forever. This will have people angry at me, but I would prefer a no meat society. So no killing of animals. I'll be in, even if it's hard for me. Explain one truth about human nature or one ethical principle to live by that you have learned from experience. I remember before my father passed away, he had a two-year disease. And the last time I saw him, he came to me and we hugged and kissed. And he said, thank you for being kind to me. And it was very touching. You know, it was like I felt I had been a good son. So I think it's being kind to all. Yeah, being kind seems to be the new rule for the next planet. Last week's pioneer was the technologist Pamela Pavlicek. She asked you when you travel to Planet X1, what about Earth will you be nostalgic about? I think if I look at this COVID face, I would miss, I mean, what I like is just slow time, being with family, sleeping in the afternoon when I want, not having to get up in the morning for meetings. I really like that. So if suddenly it was a more regimented time zone, I would really miss that. So that's definitely would be nostalgic. This kind of. And our last question. Could you please identify a question to ask our next week's pioneer, who will be the American media theorist, Douglas Rushkoff? Well, you know, on his, it says his first book was rejected. It was on the internet. The publisher said, we don't think the internet will be around for another year. So it was rejected. So I would ask him, what does he think is the next big forecasting error? Thank you so much for joining. I think you will be fit to board our little mission and come with us to next one. Thank you Sounds so great. much for joining the show today. Um, and I think, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Brilliant. Thanks so, so much. I enjoyed it. So thanks, everyone, for watching the show today. Next week, we will be back on our usual afternoon slot on Thursday. Joining us then will be author Douglas Rushkoff. Um, and I hope you'll be in there as well. And this show is made possible by our hosting partners, Accenture Interactive and Factor 3, and with the support of the video platform provider 23. So thanks to everyone involved in planning, organizing, and producing the show, especially to the next team and our guests. And hope to see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.